so uh, here's how the second half is going to run. So we have two more panels, and then we have Roar. So these are distinct things. So don't forget your Roar card. You're still looking for the, the most impactful, insightful things you've heard during the day with the purpose of sharing them at the end. And so with that, I think we're, we're just going to launch right in. And we're going to, we have, so two additional panels, then we're going to Roar, then we're going to close, and that's it. All right. Charlene, you're looking. Oh, we're, we're going to mingle. I'm sorry, we're, we're going to mingle. <laughs> Mingle? It actually, it, I, in, in this particular case, it, it doesn't come with booze. I'm not exactly sure how it works. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we couldn't give you some alcohol on the. Where are you going? You're the moderator. <laughs> this is my, uh, my co part. Oh, they have, a, they have a seat for you up there. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sitting up there either. <laughs> Okay, so panel number three. In the afternoon, we're going to move into um, bigger issues. And we're, we're trying to tackle some of the things that make things difficult and put a positive spin on it. This afternoon, we're going to talk, first panel is going to talk about decision making that promotes health. How are decisions made? What are the trade-offs that you have to make? What are the economic considerations? Um, you know, economics is, is a biggie. You have to be able to convince um, your customers or whomever you are on why this makes sense financially for them. So we have a very distinguished interdisciplinary panel. We have Claire Barnett, who's um, the founder of the Healthy Schools Network. We have Stephen Breslin, who, has, who actually is an architect for NIH and in charge of the design guides for NIH. So if you don't like your building, talk to him. <laughs> then Kirsten Ritchie, who's um, with Gensler. She's the director of sustainability. Uh, she used to be on the USGBC board. Um, and then um, Lorna Rosenberg, who is with EPA, and she's a schools person. And she's going to talk to you about EPA and the federal attitude on this. So we'll, it's the same format as before. Each one has five minutes, and then we'll talk. And Claire, you get to go first. Only Kirsten's up. Maybe Kirsten goes first. I'm sorry, Kirsten, go, Kirsten goes first. I changed the order from what's on here. I forgot. So this punches you forward. OK, great. Well, thank you all for coming back. Um, it's like, where's the sunshine? Um, and uh, you know, yes, coming to, back down after lunch, I know it's always a trying time. But I want to talk to you about kind of uh, well-being at work, 10 key design interventions for a healthier, happier, and more productive workplace. Um, just a little bit about Gensler. So you know, we do a lot of space design. Um, we do about 6,000 projects a year. We touch about 350 million square feet of building space around the world. So um, we have I mean, a pretty strong design influence. And what we've been doing, we've been doing a, fair, a lot of research on the whole issue of how does design, how can design affect health or well-being or happiness in the workplace. Um, and what we've really identified, kind of 10 key design interventions, activity, ergonomics, air quality, you can read the list. And I'll be talking about those in more detail, but how they then map to those things, that whether it's productivity or human focus or attention or memory or fatigue, um, and then also even mapping to, you know, reduce, helping to reduce cancer or reducing asthma. Um, and there's a lot of that, 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 that those synergies and, and that, it, that um, design um, actually really can play a very big role in improving all these things. If you want more detail, a shameless plug, gensler.com slash research and gensler.com slash WPI. WPI stands for our Workplace Performance Index. We have survey data of over 150,000 people across a whole host of performance issues in, within the built environment. Um, so number one, activity. Did you know that 80% of the jobs today require little or no physical activity? It's been a huge shift and unfortunately in the wrong direction um, just even from the 1960s when we had at least 50% of the jobs required physical activity. We have to get more active. And we know that after an hour of sitting, production of fat burning enzymes declines by 90%, right? So, I mean, this is the kind of things where you, we, there's the data there. Do we really, how much more data do we really need to say we need to be more active? No, you don't really need a whole lot more. Um, so how do we do that in the built environment? 
why are we all sitting at this conference? Why don't we have some of those cafe tables up here so some of us can be standing? Um, you know, the move towards sit-stand stations. One of the things we do have to recognize with sit-stand stations, if you're standing more, we need to be paying attention to what does that mean to the flooring materials that are using. Do we have to have something that's more resilient and so softer that, you know, that if you're standing all day? You have to really consider that. But it's really important. How do we design to get people to be more active? I think it also means that we design to shift spaces up much more frequently. We should be looking at modular systems, modular walls, so we can reposition and change stuff you know, every year or 18 months or two years, not build the building, build you know, the cube farm, and have it there for 15 years. No, we need to be shifting stuff up because you want to change. You know, um, that's how you're going to get people active. Number two, ergonomics. 86% um, of office workers report some discomfort from their office equipment and furniture. And we design a lot of offices. 86% of the people on set are dissatisfied with, with their working environments. One of the worst things you have, the ergonomics, everybody has tendonitis. Well, that's because you're sitting in, in one place all the time. It links to activity. If you get people up and moving around and they're working on their computers in different ways, on their laptops, standing up, or not even using it at all, combined with having, um, having furniture and having equipment that supports that really makes a bit, you know, can really, really help from an ergonomic situation, make people much happier. Um, and also the staircase, getting people to walk up and down staircases. It uses different muscles. It bends your body different ways. It helps your back. You know, just thinking about all those things. Healthy air. Okay, so this is one definitely, you know, where we, we find that employees um, who reported that air in their office is always fresh were 3.5 times more likely to report that their work environment is energizing. I guess I gotta move fast, I don't have two minutes. Um, and uh, so healthy, this, you know, we have to deal with it from an emissions perspective of materials, clearly. But the, what Gail brought up earlier, the idea of air movement, you know, it's stuffy is bad. You want air movement. You don't necessarily want to hear it. You want to see it through fans or you want to see it through, you know, through some sort of art sculpture that, that moves. Um, and uh, of course, you want to be able to open the window and look outside and get some air. Lighting, clearly really, really important. We know you really, we want to have people best take advantage of natural daylight. Like even here, can you put down some solitudes or something to bring in natural light into this conference room as, you know, being deep down in the bowels of, of, of a building are problematic. But we have to design better lighting. I think, you know, we're also looking at things like ectochromic glazing to deal with glare issues because you want to manage that as well. Um, but there's a lot of different things we can be doing. The sensory environment. This has been touched upon through a number of presentations. Um, but the truth is we're sensory creatures. We were not designed to live in beige on white. We weren't, you know? Um, and so it's color, it's texture, it's audible sounds, whether it's the little fountain that's running. It is um, even smells somewhat. I and mean, we don't, you know, we have to be careful about introducing chemicals into the environment because some of us have a sensitivity to that. But how do you design, and or actually the importance of designing by bringing and, and bring in all the senses. It doesn't cost more to paint a wall red than it does white. Right? So, I mean, again, from the cost perspective, a lot of these interventions are cost neutral. They just have to be designed in. Um, acoustics, big issue, especially as we move more and more to open plan. And a lot of it is both, it's auditory, but it's also visual noise that we have to deal with. And so providing those little spaces that people can go and, you know, hide and focus on their own is really, is, is necessary, as well as what you can do from this open plan design to help um, deal with it with the sound. You know, how is it that I can really concentrate at Starbucks, but I can't my open plan at the office? You know, one must wonder about those kinds of things. Interaction with nature, again, another very, very important thing. 12% um, of employees were more productive and less stressed than those who worked in an environment with no plants. And how many of you work in environments where you're not allowed to have a plant on your desk? Oh, only one. Okay, one. There's, I mean, we have a lot of companies that say so you can't have that, which is kind of ridiculous. But again, the interaction with nature, this you can take advantage of, of course, if you have good daylight and you're looking outside, but what can you do to really give us a sense of working with, um, with plants? Water nutrition, really important. Lack of water is the greatest source of fatigue. How do you have good water close by? I drink, went to drink from the drinking fountains. They don't work, right? Um, so how do you, you know, having hydration stations, uh, around where, and people, you know, give people their water bottles. Maybe that's the gift when they first start working and they have their own water bottle they can carry it around. And then also access to really good, you know, snacks, um, not vending machine Doritos. How do you put in, you know, whether it's almonds or fresh fruit? Work with your local, um, uh, you know, um, organic co-op to, to have deliveries. 
Then user control. This is the desire for personal control of an environment is a fundamental human characteristic. We want to have control of our space, right? And whether it is having a little fan to make me a little more comfortable, whether it is pictures of my kids, whether it's, I don't know, a domino, a mahjong set that I have a running game with, whatever, um, we need to build more of that ability for user control in our environment. And finally, the whole idea of motivation and nudges. Those little things, like the poster, you know, um, you know, take the stairs, save electricity, or you know, jumping rope. This is painted on on the, the lockers over at Salesforce. Um, but we have to remember, it also takes 21 days to change a behavior. So you can't just put it up once and walk away. You need, you know, how do you design these things to encourage behavior over a longer period of time? Um, just in summary, so why do we do this? Because it generates happy employees, and we find happy employees are twice as productive. They stay at their job five times longer. That's a huge, huge cost benefit to companies. Um, they're six times more energized, 10 times fewer sick days, generally 30%, 37% higher sales, three times more creative. Um, happier employees mean a better bottom line. So we were going to do a video. We're not, but you can get up and be happy. Thank you. <laughs>